This is WU2D testing on 3875. WU2D on 3875. Wow, not bad. Um, this is uh, a cigar box PDM rig, if you want. It's an IRF 510 modulated by an IRF 630. So you guys didn't think I was going to let this thing languish and uh, not come back to it. I had to make this thing work. And uh, I can tell you that in this video, um, you know, I found a few things I wanted to adjust, but the basics of it, I think we've gone as far as we can with the TL494 PDM power supply chip. And what I've done is I have developed a first principles PDM generator. Uh, it's using a 555 timer, in this case the CMOS version of the timer, along with a couple op amps and a comparator chip. So this system essentially replaces the microphone amplifier and PDM system and the driver that, the, uh, that was originally in the transmitter. And I can tell you I'm getting good results with this very simple PDM modulator. Um, you're going to like it because it's single supply. None of this 1970s, 1980s op amp stuff where you've got to have bipolar power supplies. Now we're going single supply. We're going 90s. Single supply and lower voltage uh, with this particular PDM generator. So we'll go through that. But I just wanted to let you know that we've, uh, we've got this thing working pretty well now. And uh, I'm ready to uh, try to make contacts again. So let's try to make some contacts. Is how much gain can you throw away? Is your audio gain, you probably have an audio gain pot on the circuit. Do you have to crank it up all the way or is it down a ways? Do you have room, do you have wiggle room? Well, Tim, I actually have a whole extra op amp in there so <laughs> that I'm not using. So I have plenty of uh, opportunity to put in shaping, extra gain, uh, negative uh, limiting, negative peak limiting. So I, there's several things I can do to this thing because I've got an extra op amp in there. And uh, you know it's a very very simple circuit. This is first principles PDM. I mean this is cigar box PDM if you want. <laughs> but the, the 10 watts of course was the limitation. I had a little 30 watt I'm sorry, 30 volt power supply. So I gave 15 volts to each stage and you know, I'm kind of working it that way. It doesn't really draw that much power. So the Class E is extremely interesting and very efficient. I was shocked. And uh, it, this circuit does not care if it's using a bipolar transistor or a FET in the Class E. I threw in one of those 5 watt CB transistors and it worked just as well as the MOSFET, maybe even a little bit better. Wow. Yeah, I was going to say, depending on the device, what if you raised your B+, plus, say you used a little 48-volt switching power supply, and put, say, 30-some-odd volts across the modulator, and the rest of it across the PA, so that would give you plenty of modulation headroom. Oh yeah, that's possible. Absolutely. Um, I, it's absolutely possible to do that. Um, you're not going to upset these transistors, and I can always change the IRF 510 to uh, something a little more stout on the voltage side. You kind of... Uh, you kind of need to have three times the voltage rating on the transistor than you're running. So you start to have to use the higher voltage devices. But still, those are a dime, dime a dozen now, Tim. Over. Yeah, I figured they would be, but I, I, I find it very interesting that you put something like that together. Someday I'd like to build my own Class E transmitter, but... You know, some of the stuff I'll probably get from Steve, but the rest of it, 
is going to be my own tweaks and my own design. So you might remember in the original PDM transmitter that we built, I had uh, grouped both the PDM generator made of the uh, TL-494 as well as the RF driver onto one piece of circuit board. Now I had a lot of problems with this, bringing it in and out of the uh, circuit to do uh, updates and so on. So I decided to separate the two functions. And I, uh, I've got the original RF system on one little board inside the, uh, the transmitter. This is the one that uses the 31 megahertz clock and I divide it down with three flip-flops to uh, 3875. So there's one section of one of the flip-flops I'm not using. But anyway, that still works perfectly and that's on its own. No sense in dragging that in and out because it's a working circuit. So the part that I was really concerned about was the PDM generator itself. When using the 494, and you can see the 494 on the schematic here. It worked. I mean, it, it provided a pretty good PWM, PDM signal, um, but it was not of the quality that I would say would be something I'd want to reproduce. In other words, it was good for a kind of a, a kid's project type AM situation. And if it was put on its own board, and you worked with it for a while, I think you could make it work. But uh, I ran out of patience with the 494, and I decided to go a different route. Instead of trying to pick a more modern pulse duration modulation chip and work with that, I decided to do a first principles PDM generator. So that first principles generator is here on this circuit board. So it's the same physical size as that original board I had. I've just split them up into two different boards. So we'll go through this first principles PDM generator. Um, it uses uh, your old favorite, the 555 as the, uh, as the main clock. And then it uses an op amp system to do the integration to a triangle wave. And your old favorite, the, uh, the LM311 comparator to do the, uh, the modulation. So it's a very straightforward type of circuit. Um, I don't really like working with bipolar power supplies. You know, uh, op amps are fairly easy to use when you have a plus and minus 18 volt supply, plus and minus 15, plus and minus 12, and so on. I find it more interesting and more challenging to operate with a single supply. Specifically, one power supply and you regulate everything off that one power supply. So in this case we're using a 24 or 28 volt supply and we're making our 12 volts and our 5 volts and so on off that supply. I don't like using negative power supplies with op amps. So can you use a ramp or a sawtooth wave or a triangle wave to make PDM for EM modulation? Well, the answer is yes. Both systems work for Class D audio amplifiers, power control, and for producing AM modulation. Many of the older PDM chips, like the TL-494, use sawtooth approach, but for sine wave PDM generation, and for audio applications like Class D amplifiers. Triangle waves are preferred over the sawtooth, mostly because of their symmetry. This gives a two-sided PWM where the rising edge and falling edge are modified as the duty cycle changes. So a triangle wave will give you a symmetrical center aligned PDM for any given instant in the signal. Controlling dead times becomes easier too. A more sophisticated PDM generator for high power AM uh, usually puts a small amount of time between the required switching edges for the top and bottom switch. This is especially important for multi-switch totem pole type systems. This time is called the dead time. With the sawtooth, there's going to be some delay as the waveform peaks then goes back to zero. During this time, you'll get some distortion in the output. So generally, we prefer to use triangle waves for our PDM clock. 
Again, with triangle waves, the center of each PDM pulse stays in the same position for each PDM period, whereas with the sawtooth waveform, it produces a single-sided PDM. The center of the pulse moves as the duty cycle changes, and this adds a little bit of distortion to the re reconstructed sine wave. So we really need to make a triangle wave. I went simple and decided to use an A-stable 555 timer circuit. It's been specially modified to produce a, a true 50% duty cycle square wave, and this is the basis for my 90 kilohertz clock. I found that the CMOS version of the 555 was much more stable than the TL494's on board clock. I used an op-amp integrator to transform this nice square wave into a nice triangle wave. All op-amps have a bias that will cause the op-amp integrator to quickly rail unless a feedback resistor is added to limit the upper gain. This means that at some low frequency, the integrator will start to begin to act more like an amplifier with a pole of low-pass filtering than an integrator. But we're operating at a clock frequency that's 5 to 10 times above this limitation, so the capacitor dominates over the feedback resistor. And watch out for DC drift on op-amp integrators. Also, the op-amp requires a high bandwidth and slew rate. When the triangle changes from ramp up to ramp down, a slow op-amp can really misbehave. So use a better part than your old 741. FET input op-amps with gain bandwidths between 4 and 16 megahertz make good integrators for 50 to 150 kilohertz PDM clocks. The triangle wave and the audio are sent into a comparator. That's how we make the PDM. The DC levels are important to control as this sets the crossing thresholds and ultimately the duty cycle rest position for the carrier level control. We like to set this around 40% duty cycle at rest. Now you can put the carrier control on either input. You can put it on the triangle input or you can put it on the audio input. It really doesn't matter. I put it on the triangle input. I figured it would be less noise there. With strong upward asymmetrical modulation, that 40% duty cycle that we have at rest is generally reduced to the 25 to 30% range. I used a very modest comparator, the old LM311, which is not very fast in terms of propagation delay, but it made pretty nice looking PDM. With a single supply, setting up those signal amplitudes and the bias so the stages are in the linear region and not railed becomes very interesting. You have to jockey back and forth between each side of your power supply. Uh, I decided to use 5 volts on the 555 which would naturally limit the output when I integrated it because I only had a 12 volt rail on my op amp. So if I had operated the 555 on 12 volts I would have to reduce the amplitude externally before sending it into the integrator. Also, uh, we need to derive these reference voltages off the 5 volt regulator. So I got away with a 12 volt and a 5 volt regulator and I made my 2.5 and 3.7 reference voltages off the 5 volt. So let's go through the circuit quickly here. First of all, we have the 50% duty cycle clock. I'm running around 90 kilohertz with the TLC555. And we have the added potentiometer, which allows us to adjust the duty cycle to exactly 50%. Running the chip on 5 volts, so we get an output that's basically up and down 5050. 0, 5, 0. We run this into the integrator and uh, we get uh, an output that is in the center of the op amps range. Uh, basically, uh, we're using a little bit of offset there, and uh, we're able to send that, that offset into the op amp and just put it into linear range a little bit. We are cap coupling the triangle wave into the, uh, the comparator, so this reference is not that critical. We're just trying to get it uh, somewhat in the middle of the range for the 746 op-amp.
uh, the triangle wave uh, comes in at whatever bias we happen to set it to uh, for the carrier set. This basically sets the trigger point for the modulation working against the triangle wave to produce the PDM on the output. Coming out of the 311, it has an open collector output. We've got a 470 ohm resistor pull up. So this is nice and fast. Drives a pair of transistors in complementary symmetry a follower. And uh, this is going to go over to the input of the modulator MOSFET. Down here in the audio world, um, we have a mic input. Um, with this switch open, we can use regular dynamic microphones. Uh, with the switch closed, the uh, bias for the amplifier doubles as the power supply for the electret. So that disposes of a couple of resistors and capacitors that we would have if we were separately uh, biasing the electret on the input. Um, controlling the gain with the uh, feedback resistor working against the uh, resistor to ground and uh, we can adjust the range by uh, fooling around with R16. Uh, the amplified microphone audio goes into a Salen key uh, second order uh, low pass filter. Uh, I've got these set around 30 kilohertz, 25 or 30 kilohertz, and there's two of them. So we have four poles of uh, low pass. We also have a little bit of shaping here on the input. Um, so there's plenty of low pass filtering uh, before we get into the LM311 op amp. Uh, these uh, amplifiers are all being set by this bias voltage coming in on this uh, 100k resistor. And since these are all DC coupled, the DC goes all the way to the 311. So really we're uh, working this voltage here against this voltage. So this is going to be set around 3.7 volts. This is at 3.7 volts. The audio is going to vary the, uh, the pulse duration and uh, we can fool around with the carrier set at rest with no audio in. So that's basically uh, the entire single supply PDM modulator, kind of the first principle single supply PDM modulator. So now let's take a peek on how I put this new board into the existing transmitter. Uh, but basically I've replaced the entire TL494 part of the uh, the circuit with this new modulator driver board. Um, I have made some changes in the filter uh, based on what I've learned about PDM filtering. I have greatly reduced the value of L7. As you might remember, I, it was almost 10 times larger than this and it caused my audio output to be very muffled sounding. <laughs> That's because we were cutting uh, the high frequencies uh, right in the PDM filter, uh, which is uh, a bad thing to do. So I've now increased this. Now we have to make sure that L7 is uh, with enough inductance that we can get good downward modulation. So uh, I did oversize L7 a little bit. It calculated out as about half that value, but I doubled it up and I like what I'm seeing in the modulation envelope. Also the second part of the uh, the filter I added this 4700 puff and resonated as a uh, parallel trap right at the 90 kilohertz clock frequency giving me added protection at 90 kilohertz. So it is a uh, basically a two uh, a two section Butterworth filter but I've added this trap in the middle and uh, getting a little bit of extra filtering uh, against the uh, the clock. So other than that, I got a little surprise here with my driver. I had grounded this point. I have now attached it directly to the bypassed rail and I'm getting much better drive into uh, Q3. So that's about all there is on the transmitter. That's where we sit today. Okay, let's take a look at our little circuit and see if we can uh, look at the output of the of the 555 generator. Yeah, there we are. So here's our 
Here's the output of the 555. And I'm using a CMOS version of the 555, the 7555 or the TLC 555. I like the CMOS version a lot better than the regular 555, the bipolar. And uh, one of the adjustments allows you to set up the, uh, the duty cycle to 50%. You want to be as close to 50% as possible. So I'm using a special circuit with the 555. The native 555 with the popular A-stable uh, values will not give you 50% duty cycle. We're doing a little trick here on the discharge to allow you to adjust this to a perfect 50% duty cycle. Then we run it into an integrator. The integrator is just an op-amp and we'll go through that circuit. Then we're going to present it to the comparator and you can see we have the triangle wave. The triangle wave is on a DC because again we're not using a bipolar supply. We're using uh, a single supply and making a virtual center tap with a reference. That's the triangle going into the, the 311. And uh, of course in the other input of the 311 is where we put our audio. But, and then on the output of course uh, we can set the, the duty cycle and uh, we get a nice, put this on DC again so you can see what we're doing, and we get a nice output with a, a variable duty cycle that we can adjust. One potentiometer sets the duty cycle of the 555 and one potentiometer sets the, uh, the output duty cycle uh, for modulation. So also on board, just for completeness, I did put um, the, uh, the audio amplifier for the microphone and uh, some low-pass filtering. So we've got some low-pass filtering on board. We've got some audio amplification for the microphone on board. I've now got a jumper that I can remove to remove bias so I can handle either electret or dynamic microphones. And uh, we only have two regulators on board. We have a 12-volt regulator for the whole board and we have a 5 volt regulator that is acting as the power supply for the 555 and the 311. Um, if we were to operate the 555 on 12 volts, we'd actually have too much swing in our triangle wave. And that would kind of defeat our, our idea of using a single supply. With a bipolar supply, everything becomes easier. You can't really, uh, if you've got a plus or minus 18 volts, you're not going to override anything. But with a single supply, you have to be more careful. So the next question is going to be, hey Mike, I see that you're using the CMOS version of the 555 chip. And uh, I'd like to use a regular 555. Will it work in the circuit? Will I get the nice PWM output that I can adjust with a regular 555? Well, the answer to that is, I don't know. <laughs> but I did manage to find a 555 for you guys. This is an old-fashioned uh, bipolar version of the 555. Let's see if this works. Let me turn off the power supply. Let's take this guy out. Okay, bent pin, but now I've got the 555 in. Aha! Okay, it, it's working, but the duty factor is a little bit different. So we would have to do some adjustment in order to bring it back to where we were. Let's see if we can see what the waveform looks like. Okay. Not as pretty. Not as pretty as the CMOS 555, but it is working. We definitely don't have the 50% duty factor on this like we had on the CMOS, so we have to adjust to get it to 50%. Okay. Let's see what it looks like in the output now. Ah, there we go. Now it seems to be working. Oh yeah. Okay. So, the answer is yes, the regular 555 will work, but a little bit of adjustment. I still like the CMOS better. Okay, let's take a quick look at the PDM filter itself. This goes between the modulator and the Class E final. And uh, here's a typical two-section Butterworth filter design. It's actually one of Steve WA1QIX's 
400 watt PDM rig filters and uh, as you can see he's uh, designing uh, just two sections and uh, he's trying to get a little over 60 dB of rejection at his switching frequency which is probably up around 100 kilohertz. Um, his calculations of course uh, turned out to use a low impedance because he's running 45 volts at 9 amps at rest which is half of his power supply of a little over 100 volts. Uh, next we, uh, we look at uh, uh, his values put into one of those online calculators and you can see it gives a nice smooth curve and uh, gives us a little more than 60 dB rejection out at a 100 kilohertz. Also uh, note that the cutoff frequency is 15 kilohertz on that design. Now my incorrect filter, I had this gigantic inductor on the first uh, L1 position. It's a wonder it was working at all really because when I went through similar calculations I came out with these numbers over here. Um, if you look at that uh, you can see uh, that it gives a very similar uh, situation as uh, what Steve had except I'm up at 25 ohms instead of down at 4 or 5 ohms where he is. So I've got some work to do. Looks like my uh, filter choke is way oversized. I need to reduce this drastically. Not too far off on this side, but really messed up on the first inductor. So uh, fortunately it worked well enough that we could do something on the air, but I've got a little bit of work to do. I hope you've enjoyed this uh, video on designing your own PDM modulator using uh, common parts and a single supply approach.